I currently work for a company called Aqua Security, um, who specialize in securing your containerized deployments. That will kind of become slightly relevant later. Um, I've only been there for a few weeks, but I've been working with containers for a couple of years. And really early on in my journey with containers, I went to a talk by Julian Friedman from IBM, where he did exactly this, writing a container from Go, from scratch in Golang, in a few, li few lines of Go. And that talk was hugely influential for me, really sort of made it clear to me how namespaces work and really what containers are. And I was so fascinated by it that I basically just had to go home and write it myself. And then I started doing talks about it. And um, I think every time I did a talk, every time I did it, there'd be some kind of corner where I thought, I don't really know why I need to do that. Or what happens if I don't do that? Or, you know, just trying to f poke into the details a little bit more. So what I uh, thought I'd do today is writing my own container, but we're going to dig into some of those details and maybe explore some of the things that I had misconceptions about when I first did it, and um, now I know a little bit better, and maybe I can share with you today. So uh, we're going to talk about namespaces, we're going to talk about C groups, and then since I work for a security company, it seemed like it would be a nice thing to do to set off a security exploit in my container. So it's the black belt talk. I think probably a lot of people in the room know what namespaces are. Um, they basically restrict what resources that a process can, can see from the host machine. Um, when we start a process, we can ask the kernel to give it its own namespace for things like its own network namespace or its own process ID namespace. And that gets set up as it's created through the magic of syscalls. So without further ado, let's start writing some code. Uh, hands up if you are a Go programmer. OK, awesome. You are all my peer reviewers. You need to shout out when anything goes wrong. Great. <laughs> so what we're going to do with this program, I've got a little outline here just to save you watching me type in every single character. But what we're going to do, we're going to replicate something like the docker run command. So we're going to invoke the program with go run main.go. That's like docker. We're going to pass the command run. And then we're going to say, here's an arbitrary command and possibly some arguments that I want to uh, execute inside my what, what will ultimately be a container. So the first thing we need to do is look at that first argument and check that it is indeed run. And if it is, we'll do some running. And if it isn't, we will fall over in a big heap. OK. If things go well, we come into the run function. And I think it's a good idea to do a little bit of debugging. So we will just print out what we've been asked to do. So the thing we've been asked to run is everything from argument 2, which is going to be a command, and possibly some uh, arguments to that command. So to execute this arbitrary command, we're going to do a fork and exec, which uh, in Golang we do through the exec package. We set up a command first, set up a structure that describes what we want to uh, execute. And then we don't actually do the fork and exec until later on when we hit that run function. When we're setting up what we want to uh, exec, we give it the command and possibly, oops, possibly some arguments. So at this point, there's absolutely no containerization, but I just want to run and make sure that it's, it's OK. So I've got two windows here onto a, a virtual machine running on my Mac. So I'm sharing a, a directory between my Mac so that I can edit in Sublime, and I'm actually going to run the code in my Ubuntu virtual machine. So. Let's do something really simple to warm up. We need to do run, and we'll just do echo hello. Hooray! All the code reviewers, you did well. It, it worked. So it told us we were going to run echo hello, and it did the job, and then it finished. So let's add some containerization to that. It's 
really easy to do. We just have to pass in some attributes. Oops, syscall. And we say we want some flags when you do clone. And the first one we're going to do is we want a new Unix time sharing system, which is a namespace that pretty much just covers the host name. So when we do command.run, that's going to ask the kernel to execute that process or create a new process with this new host name namespace. So I can run that again. Oh, what I want to do is run a shell, because then we can explore the host name. So I'm inside a shell running in my container. And if I uh, change the host name here to container, I can check it's called container inside my container. But I can just double check that it hasn't uh, affected the rest of the machine. Yay, we have the beginnings of a container. It's, it's happening. But it's pretty hard to see whether or not I'm actually inside a container or not at this point. So to make my life easier, what I want to do is set up the host name before I execute the bash profile so that I can have this, you know, my host name here replaced with um, container. I quit out of that while I remember. So it would be nice if I could do something like, this must thing is just a wrapper, by the way, to catch any errors. Um, it would be nice if I could do something like setting the host name here in the, in the program. This takes a list of bytes. But this would be a bad idea because I haven't started the new process yet because we do that in run. So if I call set host name before I call run, I'm just going to set the host name in the host. So what we're going to do to avoid this is do like a double fork and exec. So the first time we fork and exec, we're going to set up the namespace. And then the second time, we can do things inside that namespace and execute the command that we're trying to run, like the shell. So first time through, we're going to call run. Uh, rather than just setting up the command to do command arguments, I want to run this program again. And we can do that using proc self exe. Now, slash proc is going to become an old friend over the course of the next half hour or so. Uh, so this time when we uh, call into the program, I want to pass in, instead of run, I want to pass in a command child. Uh, and I'm going to append all the uh, command and the arguments that I've been passed in. OK. And I'm going to set up my namespace. That's going to call the program again. And if I've been invoked with child, I'm going to call this second version, child, where this time I don't need to set up a namespace because I've already done it. This process should be already inside the namespace that I already set up. And I can do things inside that namespace like change the host name. Making sense? This is Black Belt, so I'm assuming you're all way ahead of me. Let's see if it works. So uh, we can tell that it did because we can see the prompt changed. Set container up inside my container, but just to confirm, it hasn't affected the host machine. Hooray. The next thing I would like to do is uh, have my container have its own uh, process list. And there's another one of these flags, these claim flags. Oops. Own, uh, process ID, PID. So we can run that. I need to just quit out of here and run it again. And if we do PS, 
we see absolutely no improvement at all. We can see processes that are running inside the host machine. I think I might be inside a container, inside a container, just looking at that. Um, yeah, the reason why, even though we set up that new uh, process ID namespace, but it's, it's not showing up here in PS, is because when you run PS, it actually looks inside our friend slash proc. And inside slash proc, there's a directory entry for every running process on the machine. So if I want PS inside my container to only see the processes that are running inside the container, it needs to have its own copy of slash proc. And to do that, we're going to give it its own file system. So basically, from root down. And we're going to do that with cheroot. I'm going to quit out of here, and I think I'm in two containers, so yeah, great. So, if I look at root on my host machine, I've marked it with Ubuntu host root, just a file there, just to identify it. I also have a copy of an Ubuntu file system sitting here under home Liz. And if I look in there, I've marked that with Ubuntu container root, just so we can tell the difference between the two. And all we need to do is to root into that directory. Now, this is the first place where I had somehow got hold of the wrong end of the stick. I thought that you had to have mount namespaces set up to do this. I don't know where I got that idea from, but certainly I you may find videos out there that suggest that that's the case. It is not, as we'll demonstrate. However, one thing that is a good idea is uh, to change directory explicitly to somewhere after you do Chiroot. So apparently Chiroot gives you, leaves you in some undefined location. So it's a good idea to change directory. Okay. So now that we've done this, if we run our container again, we should find that it is now, root on inside the container is Ubuntu container root. It's got its own file system set up, including a proc directory. So what happens if I look inside proc? We find absolutely nothing. And if we run PS, it tells us why. Well, it basically tells us we need to mount proc. So proc is not just your average common or garden file directory. It's a pseudo file system. And pseudo file systems are a way for the, the kernel to communicate information into user space land. So in this case, it's communicating a bunch of information about running processes into user space land. That error told us what we need to do. All we need to do is mount that uh, directory, so it's proc, proc, proc. Bought a proc yet? I told you it would get very familiar. Oh, I need that to be capitalized. I am also just going to tidy up after myself and unmount it when I'm done with it, after we've finished executing the command. Okay. So, just reiterating, I have not got a mount namespace at this point. So quit out of this, run it again. Oh, and where are my code reviewers? Oh, I'm always missing that comma. Thank you. <laughs> right. So this time, if we look in slash proc, we see a ton of information, including some uh, directories with nice, low-numbered process IDs. And if we do PS, it's only showing us processes running inside the container. So that's pretty cool. So that had me scratching my head, wondering about, well, why do we have this mount namespace thing? You know, what's, what's the point of that? So what we'll do is illustrate it by mounting a temporary file system. So I'm, 
took me ages to figure out like what these, because I was always doing proc, proc, proc. What, what do they all mean? So I'm going to call my mount point thing. I'm going to mount to a directory called my temp. And the type of this file system is a temporary file system. Remember the comma this time. I am going to clean it up when I'm done. OK. So if I look at what's mounted inside my container, I can see proc, and I can also see my temporary file system. And uh, if I look inside my, my temp, there's nothing there. I can also look at that directory here on the host. So it's, if root is mounted to home, Liz, Ubuntu, FS, my temp is here, and there's nothing in it. So what's a temporary file system? It's another one of these pseudo file systems. It, uh, when, rather than writing information actually to disk, it just holds it in memory. So it looks like files. And so I can do something like um, hello.com. And now I can, well, let's do that. I can see uh, that file. It looks like a normal file. I can also see that on the host. So this is where the mount namespace comes in. If I... Uh, add another one of these flags. This is called new NS. I believe that historically this namespace was the first one that was put into the kernel. So it, it refers to mounts even though it's called NS standing for namespace. So quitting out of this. Um, oh, typo. <laughs> Okay, um, so my, one of my mount points didn't get cleaned up. That could be a bit annoying. Uh, let's see whether this works. <laughs> um, so I want to touch that file again. Say something different this time. Yo, docker.com. I can see it inside my container, and if luck is with me, I can't see yo docacon inside my temp. So what's the mount point that the container is seeing is no longer visible to the host machine. Or at least the temporary file system isn't. But let's go back to slash proc. If I, what I'm, I'm going to do is just run a process inside my container uh, that's just going to last for a long time and find its ID in the host. So that sleep process in the container on the host is called 8809. And if I look in slash proc 8809, I can find a bunch of information about that process running inside my container, including, uh, oops, 8809. Uh, the mounts. So even though they're not, if I run the mount command, um, and I'll just grep for thing, that's the first one that never got unmounted, but the second one isn't visible. Um, so the, name, the mount points that have been set up inside their, uh, their own namespace are not visible on the host, but you can see them through slash proc. And as... Diego mentioned uh, uh, this morning in the keynote, there's quite a lot of stuff that uh, gets leaked through slash proc into the host. So, for example, I can look at all sorts of... Well, what I'll do, let's set up an environment variable. Location is DockerCon Austin. And uh, I'm going to do that sleep thing again. Um, It'll be a different process ID this time. And we'll look at the environment for 8815. This is null separated, so I'm just going to make it a little bit easier to read by swapping the nulls for new lines. And you can see there 
that environment variable that we just set inside the container is perfectly visible from the host. And 12-factor apps have us passing information around to configure our containers using environment variables. And it's worth being aware that anything you pass that way can be accessed from the host. If, even if you trust your host, if there were an exploit, if you've got secrets inside your environment variables, well, that exploit, if it's able to read slash proc, it can mine all sorts of interesting secret information from those environment environ, uh, files about all your running containers. So that's really quite a, a, a risk there. Um, we heard Diego talking about the solution that's built into to Docker Swarm this morning. And at Core, we also have a, a, a sort of a similar comparable approach where um, rather than writing a secret value like a database password or a certificate directly into the environment variable, what you do is use a key value store, something like HashiCorp Vault or um, the Amazon KMS, and you'd, put, you'd pass the key to the secret rather than the secret itself in as the environment variable value. And then uh, we have an Aqua agent that would run, or it runs on each node, and it can intercept um, when we're creating the, the container and look up the secret and write the secret value into memory for that, the processes in that container. So what goes to disk is only ever the key rather than the, the actual secret itself. So that would prevent an exploit on the host from being able to get that secret information out of your uh, environ file. OK, that is a ton of stuff about namespaces. Let's talk a little bit about C groups. So if namespaces restrict what you can see on the machine, a C group, a control group, restricts the resources that you can use. And they are manipulated in a really very different way from, uh, from namespaces. Uh, they're done through yet more of these pseudo file systems. Um, so we're going to well, create C groups and, and assign C groups to those, assign processes to those C groups by creating directories and files. When you start a process, it inherits all the C group information from its parent. And uh, then at some point, if you want to in the future, you can create a C group. You can move that process into a C group whenever you like. So it's not something you have to set up when you create the process. And the kind of resources we're talking about, there are, there are loads of them. Uh, things like memory, devices, um, you know, the amount of CPU you can use, and all that kind of stuff. Let's just quit out of that. Um, Exit. Right. Um, so let's look at some C groups. And if I, as they're pseudo file systems, they are mounted. So we can see a bunch of them there, I don't know, 10, a dozen uh, different subsystems uh, mounted under sysfs C group. They might not actually be in sysfs C group. You might want to check that if you were. Uh, building something in production, but that's where they are on my machine. And if we look, for example, in, let's look in the memory subsystem, and what we see in here is a, a ton of, um, well, information and parameters that you can configure about um, control groups. But this is just about memory control group. We can see in here a directory called Docker. I'm guessing Docker put it there. I probably ran some Docker containers on this machine. And Docker created this directory. And if I look inside it, I see another set of very similar parameters. So uh, it's like a hierarchy of um, different parameters. If you want to assign a process to a control group, you can write it. ID into uh, the C group. Let me just, if we look, C group 
docker.prox. Now, I'm not running any Docker containers, so I don't expect there to be any processes in here, and there aren't. But if I look in the sort of parent C group, I expect all the processes to be in here, and there's a load of them. Right, so that's kind of what the control group file system looks like. Let's create one. Um, I'm going to save a little bit of time by, uh, I have a function I prepared earlier to set up a control group. And in this case, I'm going to uh, create a control group for the number of processes. It's called PIDs. So uh, before I forget, let's make sure I call this function. Otherwise, it would be embarrassing. So I'm making the assumption that uh, the, the PIDs pseudo file system is mounted under sysfsc group. Um, and there's a directory called PIDs. Inside that, I'm just going to create a directory, and I'm going to call it Liz. And inside there, I'm going to write a file called PIDs max, which is the name of the file that lets you limit the number of processes. And I'm just writing the value 20 to say, I only want 20 processes to be allowed to run inside this particular C group. Uh, I'm writing a flag to notify on release. All that says is, if there are no processes left in this control group kernel, you can just get rid of it, I'm done. And then finally, I'm going to write the current process ID of, of my current running process into the C group prox, so the list of processes in that C group. So, I saved it. Okay. Doesn't look any different from the point of view of the container, but if I look inside the PIDs directory, we should see, let me bring that up a bit, yeah, we see a Liz directory. That's kind of what we expect. And if we look inside there, we can see, well, we can see the files that I wrote, like notify and release and pids.max and cgroup.prox, we can also see that the kernel has written some other information in there. And that's kind of typical of a pseudo file system. We didn't write all that, those files. It, it created a bunch of extra things. And uh, we can, let's run a process inside the container. We'll find it. It's 8850. And if I look at the uh, set of processes inside my C group, we can see 8850, which is running inside my container, which has been assigned to this C group. It also got assigned to, uh, to this C group. And we'll just double check that the limit on the number of processes is 20. OK, right. So we can't run more than 20 processes inside this container. Right. This is where I would really like to be able to crack my knuckles, but I can't. So you have to imagine that I don't. Okay. What we're going to do to test whether this really works is one of these. If you haven't seen one of these before, this is a fork bomb. Okay. <laughs> This is where it's really important that I type into the right window, because if I type into my host, it will be <laughs> not good. OK, so what, what did that mysterious set of characters do? So um, we're going to define a function inside the shell called colon. And inside that function, we are going to call colon. We're going to pipe the results of colon into colon, and we're going to run that in the background. So that is just going to keep creating a lot of processes. We have to remember to invoke it the first time by running colon. The anatomy of a fork bomb. Right. Are we ready? <laughs> OK. So that is trying to create a lot of processes. And if we look on the host at what's going on, we can see there's some shell processes and some defunct shell processes. But there aren't that many of them. It's not gone crazy. This is, you know, I think we have successfully 
constrain the number of processes to 20. However hard that fault bomb tries, it can't exceed that, uh, that number of processes. So although that container is now useless, the rest of my host machine is still fine. We have constrained, we've, we've contained that exploit and made it not affect everything else that's going on in the machine. Hooray! My container worked, people! <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> so, if you like fork bombs, we have some t-shirts on booth S23 for Aqua Security with fork bombs on them, so you can wear your own fork bomb and, and remember how to set them off for yourself. Um, with that, I think I have like a couple of minutes if people have questions. <laughs> Oh, God, it's from the front. It'll be hard. Yeah, it's just a quick question. Uh, <laughs> is your code available on GitHub for us to examine? Uh, there is a version. It's not this latest version with all the bits and bobs, but I will push that. That's a really good point. Um, it's on uh, under my ID, Liz Rice, and I think it's called Containers from Scratch or something really obvious. Do you have to be root to be able to read the environment variables from slash proc? That's a really good question. I don't know. True. Yeah. I guess it depends what the permissions are on slash mm. part. I was just wondering how much of a security hole it was. That was yeah. Amazing. It's a really good question. See, that's what I have to do next time. I have to dig into even more details. Yeah, this is a, not a question, just a comment. I've been wearing a shirt with a fork bomb on it for a year, and I didn't know. <laughs> awesome. Did you get it from Aqua? Uh, I got it from Dockercom. <laughs> oh, it probably is. Yeah, yeah that would be Aqua. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Going once, going... If, if there's, like, now a really huge spate of people setting off fault bombs, it's not my fault, right? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Liz. Um, and so before giving one last round of applause, I would like to remind you to uh, rate talks from the mobile app and say how great the Black Belt talks were. Um, just something, a little contest with Michael Walkers. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much.